Good morning and welcome to the run-up. Uh, my name is Uchechuku Onodo. Uh, today we're going to be doing an analysis of the major, three major presidential candidates. And to have that conversation with me, I am going to be having a political analyst, Boogie Okuimoy. Uh, also, we will be having Babashola Owaje talk about grassroots politics. And from there, we're going to move on to talk about the probable after effects of the flood and the looming food scarcity that might come with it. And uh, to have that conversation with me, I'm going to be having Mary Ufon. And uh, that's a rundown of everything packed up today. Uh, and uh, I am already here with Boogie. Good morning, sir. Okay, uh, we're talking about the three major presidential candidates that we have, and we're going to be doing a full-on analysis uh, on all of them. But first off, before the primaries came up, we had a long list of people who were vying for, uh, you know, the presidential seat. Uh, talking talk about the Kingsley Moalos and a lot of them. The uh, but there has been agitations, and people are not happy, especially after the primaries happened. So my question to you is, do you think that the fact presidential candidates are picked by you know, a college of delegates and uh, not the entire electorate, do you think it makes for a credible selection? Well, uh that's, that's part of the, the, the burden we have to bear with democracy. As acceptable as democracy is being a government of the people, by the people, for the people, the way it is practiced comes up with a few challenges and, of course, with its many advantages. And one of the major challenges of uh, democracy, democratic process, is uh, the fact that political parties give us candidates, you know, um, before we can have candidates to choose from. The political parties within themselves through the delegates of the primary system through our candidates. So the reality is that we are actually constrained to go with whatever options the political parties give to us. And that is why some people will still always clamor for independent candidates where people who don't want to be, who have ambitions and who don't want to be bogged down by the whole process of the primaries, especially the way primaries are conducted in our country today. Um, we all know how those primaries are done. We all know how delegates um, are reported to be enticed to determine who they drop as a flag bearer. So, um, of course, it doesn't doesn't give us it doesn't give us the best. But I mean, there's no perfect system. So that's a burden we have to bear in terms of going through the democratic process. It's unfortunate that that's how it, it is. But I mean, that's we we'll keep pushing for the independent candidacy to just give that option for people to have a choice outside what the political, political parties present. So it's really, it's, um, it's, it's not a plus, and we hope that at some point we'll be able to have a, an independent candidacy. Okay, um, there has been a lot of conversations around, um, you know, the competence, uh, and if these candidates can be trusted, and of course their comp competence, uh, judging them based on their past experiences and you know how we've been watching them so far, and our perceptions of when I say our, I'm talking about the Nigerians, I'm talking about the electorate, uh, judging these persons based on their competence and of course the experience they've had in leadership, in, gov uh, in, gov in governance. Uh, can you tell us the factors that determine competence uh, given the current political situation in Nigeria? Competence. Um, you tie competence to the problem that is supposed to be solved. So you can't have, um, it will be a bit difficult to have a holistic approach towards determining what competence is. Mm. Um, if we look at insecurity, we might look at the candidates and see that this person is most competent to deal with that. We might look at economy and we determine that this other candidate is best positioned to deal with that. We might look at unemployment, we might look at so many other factors really, and each of these factors requires a particular 
level of competence to be able to fulfill. So we may, we may not be, based on your question, we may not be able to holistically determine that, oh, this particular person is competent, is the most competent out of all of them. We might have to look at these issues individually, the economy, the security, um, job creation, wealth generation, foreign policy, each of these different areas have. And I think all of the candidates, that, well, most of the leading candidates that we basically have today have their strengths in these different areas. So I think it's the left to the Nigerians at the end of the day to assess the combination of all of these competencies and decide which direction would be the safest, safest to go to. So we, it, it might be a bit difficult for me to say, oh, this is the most competent person or that is the most competent person because in these different areas, we have a different, for example, um, some would argue that Peter Obi seems to have a better understanding of um, the economy and wealth creation and wealth generation and moving us from a consuming nation to a producing nation. Oh. On the other hand, some argue that when you look at security, um, probably Etinubu seems to have, might, you know, have, have um, more capacity oh. to deal with that, considering the vice presidential running mate he has, who seems, who some say, you know, but I won't want to work yeah. with conjectures and, and rumors. But I think having govern the state like our new state, mm. he should have more understanding of what the situation is. He should have more understanding of what, what the problems really are and possibly will be in a better position to prove a solution. So we have to just look at these candidates in different capacities as it, as it, as it relates to their competence. So okay. it will be difficult to really say... Let, oh, let, let me make those, this question those, easy. Those let, me, let me break it down for you. Uh, let, let's take it away from okay. whoever we know their names and their faces. Okay. Uh, let's take it away from okay. them, from the candidates, presidential candidates that we already know about. Talk about uh, okay. Bola Ahmed Tinubu, uh, Atiku Abubakar, and Peter Obi. We don't know them now. We're just talking about a Nigeria that we're looking forward to. Uh, and you know, there has been a lot of conversations about the educational background, uh, uh, their age, where they are coming from in terms of experience. So if you were, let's say, uh, somebody who is Mohammed Chukwemeka uh, uh, Waziri, this person does not exist, but he's a presidential candidate, and we're looking at him coming out. How would you judge him uh, based on you know, the question that I, I asked you, looking at his competence? What would you be looking out for? Well, the first thing I'll be looking for is experience. Like I tell people, you for elective positions, there is no, there is no, there is no manual. You know, there is no school you go to to be trained to be an elective officer. Mm. And there is the dynamism of the Nigerian structure. What the people in Akwaibom will refer to as a leader who has done well and is competent is different from what probably people in Kano will consider for elite. I mean, each of these areas have their peculiar challenges and their peculiar expectations. So um, experience will be very key, knowing that this person has functioned in this capacity and has an idea. If you look at our, our politics today, um, just this morning, I was watching a video on, 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 online where um, the former governor of Lagos State, uh, Raji Fashola, was talking about the income in government, you know, and he was, you know, talking, proffering solutions and all of that. And it seemed like they had the magic wand. But when they got into the office, they realized that the view from outside yeah. is different from the view from inside, you know. So um, you might blame them, oh, they didn't perform despite their promises, but we must make the excuse for them that mm. it was easy to have been speaking from outside. So, so, so experience is going to be one of the first things that we're going to look at. Then the second thing we're going to look at is personality. What kind of a person is this candidate? Is this somebody who has a history of empathy? Is this somebody who feels what the citizens feel? Is this somebody who, um, who, who, who is touched by what his people go through? So we look at his personality. Is this somebody that is... Um, that is, that is um, comfortable with graft, with fraud, with uh, corruption? <laughs> is this somebody who's, who's understandable? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, for example, looking at the ASU, ASU situation, yes. I think somebody who, had, um, who has empathy, who feels what it is for parents to have children at home for so long, 
for parents not to know when the children they are raising through school will be going through. I mean, somebody who, had, who has strong empathy would probably have addressed that issue much earlier and you know much better. So I think the person's personality, let's look at this person's antecedents. What were his comments on certain situations? What was his position when certain things happened? It helps us get an idea of the kind of personality that we're going to be putting into yeah. the office. I mean, the last U.S. elections, the last U.S. tenure, Donald Trump, showed us how much a man's personality can bring to bear on the office. Sure. Another thing I would look at is um, um, the person's integrity. I, I'm, I'm careful about the word integrity, but more like um, what are the person's values? What are, what are the person's, what's the person's history? In the different places where the person has been entrusted in public office, how did he conduct himself? How did he, because a lot of us know that one of the biggest problems we face in this country today is corruption. I mean, if there was no corruption, the power sector would be working. If there was no corruption, as um, the university systems would be working. If there was no corruption, we won't be talking about um, crude oil theft. So we look at the person's background and we look at the person's history. Mm. And then we also look at the person's, unfortunately, some people might not like to hear this. I don't want to say age, but the person's physical, mental, and psychological state. Leading 200 million people, having the responsibility of the lives of 200 million people in your hands is not a joke. We have to be sure that your faculties and all the necessary um, biological parameters are in check. The job of the president is, is not a simple one. It's not an easy one. I mean, the president I mean, should be somebody who's ready to work 24 hours. If a delegation is coming from the United States, and they're on their way to probably um, another country, they have a set time that they're going to wait. Can you stay up late? Do you have the mental capacity to stay up late? <laughs> Do you have the fiscal capacity to jump from meetings to meetings? Do you have the fiscal cap capacity to, to move around when you have to move around? You know, when those limitations are there, I tell people, I say, God created man to fulfill the law of diminishing returns. In other words, a man is born and then he grows in, in capacity City, he gets to a certain point and he begins to dip. So it is a biological process that when a person gets to a certain age, it is expected, even though it is not absolutely um, compulsory, that it must be like that, yeah. that the faculty start, start reducing. You know, the person's ability to perform certain things start, start, start dropping. So this argument is why some people would request for a younger person. But I mean, that's not that's not all. It's, it's an argument, but it's not all. I mean, with age comes experience. Yes. With age comes more wisdom. So there are different. There are different. Um, but of course, I will look at the person's capacity. Look at somebody like Obasanjo, who's um, I mean, over eighty, going to ninety, but he still seems to be very fit. He still seems to, so age. That's why I didn't use age. I'm more about the person's mental capacity, his physical capacity, and his um psychological being so like i said i've talked about experience i've talked about um the person's personality i've talked about the person's physical physical right. well yes and then maybe other things. if you notice i intentionally <laughs> did not talk about education why why is that i'm going to ask you that question you know i, I was going to get to that because you mentioned uh, earlier while you were speaking you mentioned how that yeah. actually leadership nobody puts you through any particular uh, maybe physical school to teach you uh, the rudiments of leadership. And that was going to be another question, but you might have to join it with this education part of you know, your analysis. So if nobody puts you through a particular kind of school to teach you leadership, you know, when we talk about experience in Nigeria, uh, for example, it, it's not related, but I'm going to use that as an example. When young persons leave school and they are looking for jobs, uh, employers usually say you need to have five years experience, you need to have 10 years experience. And young persons usually ask, where am I supposed to get this experience from? Same thing is happening in our political space. Same people are being churned out season, uh, political season after political season. We keep hearing almost the same names all the time. And then we're supposed to have a, a, a major segment of our population covered by young persons. And these people are supposed to, uh, people that you know, in the future will be judged by their experience in leadership. How are they supposed to have this experience? Do you understand where I'm coming from now? Yes, I think I understand perfectly. 
Now, okay. let me start with the education part. Yes. When we make reference to education, especially as it relates to governance and as it relates to public office, we usually will talk about the formal educational you know, track. We think about, oh, does he have a BSc? Mm -hmm. Did he go to school? Does he have this? Education is not limited to the formal track. I mean, education is broad. Education is basically the development of the human mind. Mm -hmm. And we have seen countless numbers of people who have been successful outside of the formal education track. We have athletes, we have entertainers, we have sportsmen who have become successes, not because of what they studied in school or whether they even went to school. That's on one side. So when people talk about education and talk about, I'm not always too particular in that direction. If we say, oh, a candidate is educated, he has a master's in chemical engineering, he has a, none of that, well, let me not say none, but that majorly is not going to help him when he becomes president. Mm. At most, where that will really be beneficial is possibly when it comes to awarding, you know, when it comes to development of infrastructure and all of that. And then some of his training can come in. But being president, you know, puts a whole load of responsibility on you that transcends various sectors. So educational competence may not be, you know, what, what will be the primary. What has this person made? What kind of education, life education has this person had? There is, I mean, there are several industrialists. There are several people who have grown to become successful, who are billionaires today, who have built conglomerates, who have built massive organizational structures who employ thousands of graduates, but who never went to school. They got a different kind of education. So I, I really am not always too particular about you know, the specific formal education that somebody has received. Now to your question about, oh, when somebody gets into office, we talk about experience, where does the person get the experience? It is often said in, in, in politics, especially around campaign season, when somebody comes out for probably to contest for governor and he's a first timer, you know, we're hearing about him and he's going for government. You hear some people say things like, ah, how can he just come out and say he's going for government? He should go for council first, or he should go for local government chairman first. It sounds condescending, but if you look at it on its merits, it really is not, you know? It doesn't mean somebody who comes out for the first time cannot do well in a particular position. Mm. But it is expected that somebody who's going to be aspiring for a position as high as probably a governorship position or a presidential position should have gained certain experiences from certain other lower positions, if not for anything, to understand the process of governance, to understand the process of public service. What happens is that when a neophyte gets into a particular position, he takes too much time to adjust, to understand how things are done, to understand how, you know, and we really as a country do not have that much time to have somebody learning on the job. Mm -hmm. So it makes some sense that somebody who has decided that he has a public service career or he has a political career must begin to exercise those, 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 um, those leadership ambitions in some other position where he can gain experience before he moves to, 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 to something bigger and something higher. Mm. For students who come out of school and then you want to apply for a job and they're telling you, know, you need to gain experience here. You know, the experience may not necessarily have to be in a corporate setting. What have you done in terms of entrepreneurship? What have you done in terms of skills? What have you done in terms of, when well, you're putting together a CV, your CV can either be following an experience track. These are the experiences I have. So you're talking about the things you've done, you're talking about the places you've worked, the things you, that it might come from an academic background. So that CV is populated with your academic qualifications, it's populated with, or it might be skills. These are specific skills that I have. And look at where I have displayed them. So it is not a limitation um, for you to be asked for some experience. Right. If you have an ambition in that direction, you must begin to look for sources and ways to gain that experience. So that's, that's, that's it. For education, like I said earlier on, um, we need a president who's wise. We need a president who's empathetic. We need a president who has integrity. We need a president who, much more than we need a president who has a PhD or who has a master's or who has a... Right. That's what I think. Uh, very enlightening this conversation with you this morning, Boogie. And thank you so much for dropping by the run up this morning. It was amazing talking to you. And uh, hopefully, we'll keep talking, uh, have more conversations. It was uh, really amazing having you on the show. Thank you so much. 
And this is where we uh, Thank you very much, end the conversation about the three major presidential candidates that we have. Uh, the year 2023 is close, very close, barely four months away, and the uh, elections will be all upon us. Uh, this is still the run-up. We're going for a quick break. When we return, we're going to take the conversation down to the grassroots. You don't want to miss that. Stay with us.